listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. With me today, I've got a real special treat for you guys listening at home, and it's going to be a little bit left of field. Now, we know this is the Guitar Teaching Podcast, and my next guest may be really well suited to Tim's piano podcast. However, she's a wealth of knowledge and expert in her field, and we could learn a lot from listening to her. So let's welcome Melanie Bowers from Keynotes to the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Welcome, Melanie. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. What time is it where you are over in the UK? It is 7 p.m. Oh, nice, comfortable 7 p.m. It is. Mm -hmm. Now, I first what I first met Melanie about five minutes ago, formally uh, over a Zoom call. But as I was joking with her, I've uh, heard her voice thousands of times. Full disclosure: my partner Amy is involved in Melanie's keynotes program, and she's been using that quite successfully for. I think getting on to three years now uh, at our music school here in Melbourne, and it's an absolute fantastic program. Uh, works really, really well, but we're not here to sell it to you. We're here to ask Melanie some cool questions and figure out all the amazing things she's doing that you guys can learn from. So, Melanie, maybe give me and our listeners a brief background about your beginnings as a school teacher and how you've transitioned to creating your own curriculum and, and growing it to being in, is it hundreds of studios around the world at this point? Yes. Yeah, indeed. So yeah, my background is actually in school teaching. Um, I started teaching roughly 20 years ago. And from the get go, as soon as I had trained, I went into a school, took a job at a secondary school, which is kind of 11 to 18 age group. And realized as soon as I got there that there was no other music teacher. There were no, there was no head of music. And I was um, expected to create a curriculum as soon as I um, arrived, <laughs> which is quite a shock because normally you start your first teaching job and you've got you can walk into a department that's got everything in place. So I have really been designing curricula from you know from the get go, and it's something that I've always loved to do. And um, so then I was head of department in a different school, and then obviously had children, which is quite a common story. You have children, then you realize that actually you're a little bit too busy for the school um, teaching job, especially as head of music and especially head of um, a department where you're expected to run many concerts and lots of extracurricular um, events. So I decided to kind of take what I knew from teaching the older kids um, and, and apply it to the younger kids, essentially. So I was teaching... Uh, a key stage three in the UK, that's age 11 to 14. I was teaching them um, music at keyboards. So we were kind of doing music lessons through keyboards. I had 30 kids in a room, uh, 15 keyboards, and then decided to apply that um, outside of school to younger kids. So I essentially took a, a version of what I was doing in school and taught it to the little ones, starting off with um, age six. So that's how it all began. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And it sounds like you were really thrown in the deep end there from just finishing up uni and I guess doing your first job to having to create all this curriculum and things. Yes, but my training course did prepare us well for that. We had to kind of show that we could write a lesson plan and we could write a, a unit plan. So we, we were kind of well versed in that, but I wasn't expecting to have to actually do it myself. So you, you've come into a high school you've created your own curriculum uh, and then you've obviously started using it with some other kids who are a little bit long, younger can you tell us how it evolved into keynotes and or, or what you did to make it uh different because i'm assuming there wasn't uh 
anything similar at the time and that's how you sort of came upon something so unique? Yes, um, I had actually considered um, one of the UK's popular franchises here and then decided that actually with all my experience in writing a curriculum, I could do something myself and I could make it piano based. So there was nothing piano based at all. But I think also I had a steep learning curve because I had been teaching 11 to 18 year olds. In fact, my favorite uh, age to teach was always the 17, 18 year olds teaching them how to write a bark chorale, you know, all sorts of um, very kind of in-depth musical analysis. Um, and then I was going to teach the six year olds and I had a lot of learning to do myself. So it took me a while and I worked week to week to figure out how they learn, what they were able to learn essentially learning styles and things they they span the ages but i had to find out kind of the the content essentially of what would suit six year olds and how they progress etc yeah and that, that's a really really important point to make uh especially within the guitar teaching world because it's a very physically different instrument to play so many teachers are just like oh yeah we've got to wait until they're seven or got to wait until they're 10 and we can start teaching them but you can actually get really good results with younger kids if you teach them the way younger kids need to be taught. So exactly. what are some things you notice differently uh, that work well when you're teaching the kids around about the age of six or even younger potentially? So kids of this age need a lot of repetition, a lot of consolidation. And um, what we have with keynotes is that we have this um, cyclical curriculum structure, which essentially means you're not if you take a traditional piano method book the learning is very linear so you go from one page to the next and then you're on the next page and you kind of the teacher assumes that all of the the learning that needs to happen is happening through those um, pieces with group learning and with younger kids you you can't necessarily rely on them picking up everything along this line that you're taking them along um, and making sure that they can implement it, making sure that their understanding is secure. So we just need a lot of repetition, consolidation, but we also don't want to simply repeat in, you know, teach everything in exactly the same way from one week to the next. So we need to also offer variety. So this is how I came, well, Actually, because my key stage three classes in school were topic-based, the topic-based learning approach has fed into keynotes as well. The other thing that I was actually quite surprised by was that I assumed that because they were all beginner pianists, no one had ever had any experience before, um, and because they were younger, I assumed they'd all come to me and be able to do the same thing as each other. Okay, so I would say, right, here's a, here's a little tune we're going to learn. Let's play this together. And straight away from the very first lesson, I noticed that some people were able to learn it really quickly and some people needed much longer. And you can't obviously work with a group where you're not providing for those different paces of learning. And obviously, I knew about that in my high school teaching, um, but I think but what I thought I was going to find an issue was just the, the younger age and the, making sure the content was appropriate and attractive and engaging for the younger learners. I would need to make sure I wasn't being too kind of wordy and academic. Actually, what happened was that this was also an issue. This from the from the very first lesson, you know, some children kind of could do what I was asking to do almost straight away and some needed a lot more time. So that was kind of something that I um, I knew how to manage because of my um, teaching experience, but I needed to quickly find a plan in those early days for that kind of different learning pace. Yeah, well, I definitely want to come back to asking you a bit more about keynotes and, and what separates it from you know, your standard piano curriculum, but I do want to dive into this whole idea of managing the different levels within a group. Because I think a, a lot of what puts teachers off group lessons is the fact that, yeah, what do I do if I get someone who's a high achiever who just gets things and progresses well versus someone who's on the other end of the spectrum who just doesn't get it and then everyone in between uh, to varying degrees of level. So how have you gone about, because you mentioned in your training, what, what were you trained on how to manage that and what could our listeners at home learn to do better? 
So I'm actually also doing a PhD in this. So I'm doing a lot of research myself, but I will talk from my experience. Um, basically, there are we need to differentiate our approach to the different learners, but there are two different ways you can differentiate. And most of us as teachers are able to differentiate kind of on the fly, like reactive differentiation. You can immediately see that someone isn't doing something as we quite expect them to. So you can adapt the way that you ask them to do it, or you can kind of form some steps to what the desired outcome is rather than expecting them to get straight to the desired outcome. Um, But actually, what I think is really important is um, more proactive and planned differentiation. So you have very clear options of um, different difficulties um, for the pieces that you're teaching. Um, Not only the the pieces and the songs that you're teaching, but also um, like you need a set of learning objectives. And you say, right, I want everyone in the class to learn this. And some might learn it to this degree. And some might um, scratch the surface of this, but we, but but everyone will kind of, you know, their learning will be based around this objective, and um, and then yeah, you're constantly finding ways to make sure that everyone is constantly being challenged or supported. So those kids that need that extra support, how am I going to provide that? How am I going to give them? maybe um, an easier part or maybe give them some kind of crutch that I will then take away. How am I going to challenge those that are learning quickly and move them on to something? Um, We always used to say when I was teacher training, um, when you have students who might be gifted and talented or might be more able, you're not just giving them more work because they finished before, before everyone else. You need to kind of add an element to the, their depth of understanding. So, you're, so for example, I can explain it really easily. If you have um, everyone's playing a melody in the right hand, and you might add, you might start teaching someone how to add chords. So, you might teach them about chord one and chord five, for example, to harmonise what they're playing. So, only a couple of children might get to that in your class but you've provided them with a new skill, something that's going to challenge them and get them thinking um, in a deeper way about, you know, the skills that we're trying to develop. So, yeah, that's how, <laughs> that's kind of my my take on it. Yeah, that, that's some really, really powerful stuff there. And I, I think it's really important to point out the fact that you didn't try and give them something new necessarily in terms of, what's the next step chronologically or what's the next step in this linear pathway, but rather you went deeper and and said, well, how can I develop this skill further or what's the next level they need within the same realm? Exactly. Then, So you're adding depth to each piece. And what that means is that you can keep the students learning together. You can, they can still perform their piece all together as an ensemble. Some might be just performing it one way. Some might be performing it another way. Um, but everyone's performing together. And for me, that is really important, that collaborative learning and collaborative playing, yet you've got those individual pathways in your plans for them. Yeah, that's absolutely uh, amazing stuff. And I know many of our listeners who are hesitant about group lessons for a number of different reasons, it is one of the best things you can do. We'll hopefully get to that uh, a little bit further down the track on this podcast, but Everything Melanie's just said about uh, what I call, you know, leveling and layering in terms of just getting people to go deeper on the same thing is super important and amazingly powerful when you do it right. So getting back to the curriculum, what separates keynotes from irregular piano curriculum and everything out there from the major publicators, public, <laughs> the major publishers and uh, everything else that's available for you? Um, well, a few things, the, the, a couple that we've already mentioned. So this idea that we've got a cyclical curriculum structure. So within one kind of level or one kind of program, there are a number of books. And what happens is that each book essentially has the same skills and objectives that we're developing. Um, but we're not asking our kids to sidestep because we're providing the differentiation and the more difficult challenges for them. So um, we're saying we've got a a program and the the key aims are this, this and this, and they're basically based around the um, piano foundations. 
and then they can move through each program as appropriate. So they so once they're showing certain behaviors, so we give like we have success criteria. So what what do we need to see? What do we need to see evidenced in our learners to know that they're ready for the next program? Um, so it's it's very much a class based program, right? So that's already different to most of what's available out there. When we kind of use a traditional, a more traditional piano method, um, we, as I said earlier, we're kind of moving from page to page. We're learning in a linear way. And that's great if you've only got one student because they can move from page to page at uh, the pace that suits them. However, when you've got a group of children, it just doesn't work that way. You cannot rely on the fact that everyone is kind of understanding, absorbing, applying all the skills and concepts in the same way as each other. So that cyclical and spiral kind of idea is is what's unique about Keynotes. And then, of course, the differentiation that we've already mentioned and then really just um, it's super creative and um, because it's topic based. So we have various programs. Some are ones called Storytellers. So all the books are based around different stories and it's so programmatic. Every, we've got word painting. We've got um, compositions where they have to compose for part of the story. So it's all very creative, but kind of age appropriate, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and that just sounds amazing. It's got the elements of gamification. It clearly communicates what the learning outcomes are, which I think that's something that's often really, really vastly missing from music. Like the objective is pass the exam or... <laughs> oh, my goodness, yes. Or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, so to have those... And, and you, know, you know what, Michael? I see so many... Um, posts in Facebook groups about people talking about referral students or transition students, rather. And they get a transition student and they might say, my goodness, this student doesn't seem to know anything, right? Doesn't, how often does that happen? How often have you seen that? And what's happened is that, of course, they know things, but they were going along one particular teacher's kind of linear progression um, and they were using maybe a different method book or whatever it was that they might have been doing, put that child in a completely new context with a different teacher who uses different methods, who has a different line of learning, they are going to seem like they don't know anything, right? If you kind of turn this around and head, what are we trying to get children to learn when they are learning to play the piano? What are the key skills, the key concepts, the key objectives and can we kind of plan a curriculum around those rather than just relying on pieces getting more progressively more difficult um, as the point of development? 100%. And I think it's almost like more prevalent in guitar because people don't realize that guitar can be a, you know, a lead instrument with single notes or it can be an accompaniment instrument or it can be a solo instrument. So there's almost three different uh, ways to play guitar and when you get teachers who learn one way and teach one way, as opposed to uh, what's you know what you would use in real life, a combination of all three, it does really seem like yeah, the students are the ones that lose out more often than not. Yes, mm -hmm. but then you also get the people <laughs> who just straight up are bad teachers and just don't prepare their students either. So uh, that's why it's wonderful. I think you know you're providing training as part of your your program as well because and. That's why we do what we do at Top Music because there are a number of teachers who not necessarily through any fault of their own, just don't know any better and were never trained otherwise, who could be doing so much better for their students and, you know, creating a higher standard of education for themselves. But unfortunately, you know, there isn't, that's not always the case. And it's often we're left to figure things out for ourselves. And, you know, you've done very well and, and gone to a very great degree with great insight and understanding of how learning works. But hopefully for our listeners at home, we're transitioning and helping you on your journey to become a better teacher. Yes. And always student-led. So, you know, we might have learned a certain way, things change, society changes, communities change. I think that always thinking about how are these children, what's the best for them? How are they learning? What can we do to meet them where they're at? I really believe in a truly child-centered curriculum. Wonderful. And I think the most important thing you said there is meet them where they're at and then figuring out 
you know, within the frame of the curriculum you've got in the class that you've got, but how do you give every student what they need to succeed uh, in order to reach that desired outcome as opposed to this is the way I teach. If you don't fit the mold, bad luck, you're a bad student. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, you did mention before uh, it, it's a class-based program and that's what separates it. So it obviously lends itself really well to group lessons and that's something we're seeing more and more of now And because there's people like yourself who are sort of championing it. What are the benefits of group lessons over private lessons, particularly for kids? So I'm going to just first of all say that group piano is a bit of an umbrella term. And when I talk about the benefits of group piano, I'm very much talking about the benefits of collaborative group piano. So everyone learning together. Um, and we we kind of... I didn't realize this, but we've come across this uh, situation where some people talk about group piano, but they actually mean piano lab. So everyone's on their headphones learning independently and the piano teacher goes around and kind of spends 10 minutes with each child and they're practicing for the rest of the time. But they can all be in completely different books, right, at completely different levels. When I think of the benefits of group piano, I'm thinking of collaborative group piano so everyone's learning together everyone's playing together I do actually have headphones some of the time in my lessons because if I'm differentiating for different learners I need to be able to monitor and uh, progress a child as is needed but then the headphones are off and we're playing together so the benefits of collaborative group piano well, first of all, it's a very musical setting. We don't often play music on our own. Now, poor pianists often do, but we don't have to. And the joy of music making and learning an instrument is playing with others and it's engaging with others and it's that kind of social element. And, you know, the kind of making music together is just so incredibly powerful Um and so that's kind of the big thing is, is making music with others. But also we know that children learn um, best with others and from others of their own age. So, um, for example, if we're kind of delivering our lessons um, in, in a way that is most impactful for them, we might listen to the different um, performances from the kids um, at the end of the lesson. And I, this is just a small example. And I might say uh, to each individual, I'm going to give them some feedback. So I might say, right, I love the way that you did this. Maybe next time you could think about this. So that's what I always say to everyone. One really good thing that they did, you know, no matter what it is, find something positive. And then one thing that they can work in, even if they have 10 things to work on, just choose one thing. And what happens is as, as you go around the kids, um, they are hearing each other's feedback and they amazingly are responding to it themselves, especially the positive thing. So I've, you know, I could test this a hundred times and a hundred times it would happen the same way. You say to someone, I love the way you did this. The next person will do that thing. So it's a really great learning tool in that sense. Um, I love with groups how you can be really you know, creative, you can play games, you can do listening, you can do composition, improvisation, all of these kind of other kind of musical skills that we're developing in a way that is them playing with each other. You know, they're playing games. Uh, and I tend to favor collaborative games over competitive games, but that's just the way I am. I can't stand to see people lose. <laughs> so, um, so you, you know, you can you can have a lot of uh, fun with games, but obviously those games are going to be um, contributing towards their learning. So those are the main um, benefits, I would say. I think it's also just a really uh, child-centered way of learning. I think it's really, it's almost... When you, when you think about a child learning one-to-one -one and a child maybe six, seven years old learning an instrument one-to-one -one, and you think there's no other setting, there's nowhere else they go in their little lives where they're on their own with an adult, you know, they learn with other people and everything else they do. So, um, so yeah, I think it's just a really uh, child-centered, child-friendly way to teach them. Yeah. Wow. There's so much great stuff in there. I, I did just want to ask you a bit more about competitive versus collaborative games because I think that's 
that was uh, something that just stuck out to me then. So can you tell me what a collaborative game is and maybe provide an example? Okay, so a collaborative game is where it requires um, everyone contributing and doing something to achieve the game or to finish the game or to, you know, or if it's a, a musical game, if it's something at the piano, then everyone does something to create the whole, if you see what I mean. Um, whereas a competitive game is like you've got this person against this person or this team against this person team and whoever gets there first is a winner. I'm, you know, I do play some competitive games occasionally, but I always notice that the same learning takes place, but we've got a nicer dynamic when we can collaborate and together we have, you know, achieved something together. We finish the game. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by collaborative over competitive. Yeah. Now that's excellent. I, like I've noticed playing games sometimes when the same people win, the people who don't tend to win as much kind of give up sometimes. And oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's the same with um, – that's a really good point because um, that's something that I always say about differentiation as well. If you're saying, right, I've got all these different challenge levels. In school, I was taught – and in fact, you know, inspectors would come into my room to watch my lessons if our school was being inspected. And they would say, I want to see which child you are doing which challenge with. So I need, I need to know that you know exactly who your gifted students are, who your students are that need more support and are kind of less able, and what, are your, what you're doing to provide for them. So... I understand that and I understand that, that that we need to know who is going to do what. But I also feel like if we start a lesson and we say, right, I've got all of these different kind of versions of this song and you are going to play the most difficult version because you're amazing and you always play the most difficult version and you're going to play the most simple version because, you know, that's where you're at. I just think it would create a really difficult dynamic and it'd be, it wouldn't be good for anyone really because I think the person who's able – still needs to, you know, work towards things and not just be given kind of the, the, you know, just be told that they're always amazing. And then the person who needs the support, um, if they're always told that they can't get to those higher challenge levels, I think that's really demoralizing and will be disengaging for them. So I always say no matter which program, which level, whether we're teaching adults, whether we're teaching four-year-olds, start everyone on the same thing. This is the main song this is what we're learning today this is how the piece goes and then we say if you manage that then you can do it this way and if you manage that then you can do it this way so we're rewarding um effort and we're saying it will be your effort that allows you to get to these um higher challenge levels and then i might subtly as i'm going around notice that someone actually might not even achieve that main thing that I'm asking them to achieve. So I might then subtly just give them a little bit of a support part or something to help them along the way. Because I think the most important thing is that they they are able to play something. <laughs> you don't want them to kind of be saying, like, I've got no idea what's going on. So, um, so yeah, that that's a really important point, I think, that you're kind of, you're giving everyone a blank canvas every lesson. You know, the people that, you know, for a while you knew, I might know that someone's always going to be doing the lower challenge levels, but one week they might surprise me. Something might have happened, that something might have clicked, they might have really practiced hard that week, and therefore they're playing something more difficult. And if I had kind of preset those challenge levels, I would not have noticed that. And I would they wouldn't have been given the opportunity to show me. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's just such a different way of approaching learning to how most people go. And you're absolutely correct in, in terms of, yes, we can always have our same favorite students in the spotlight. But if we give everyone what they need to get to that spotlight, then some of your students will blossom sometimes a bit later, but end up being better plays long term because they you know value the hard work that went into it now last sort of question and you've already given us so much in relation to group teaching but are, are there any practical tips for running group lessons better or maybe even balancing and managing the classroom when you do have maybe some kids who are a bit rowdy or are misbehaving on you oh that's a big question so i mean there are so many kind of strategies that 
you can use, but things that really, before you even walk into the classroom, need to be in place. So you need a, a structure that's suited to the age. So, for example, I say with four-year-olds, they need um, lots of variety in activities. So they're, you know, they are moving, they're coloring, they're singing, they're playing the piano, they're doing, you know, lots of different activities and only a short amount of time on each one. And that we keep the structure consistent for that age group from week to week because that's how they can manage their expectations and then they begin to feel comfortable and behave in a way that is conducive to them learning. Um, so, yeah, a lesson structure. But then also you need to then have some plans. And, and really, you know, even how many years am I into teaching? I still have things where I'm like, okay, I need to think this through because this, you know, something's not working here or a particular student or a particular class. We all have them. My most recent one, which I was telling the keynote teachers about the other day, is um, post-pandemic, I have found the kind of the younger ones, the five-year-olds, to be very overly affectionate. Okay, so before we'd sit in a circle and that's all very nice. and But now they want to sit on my lap. They want to, everyone wants to sit next to me. And I'm like, so I'm having to manage this kind of, you know, uh, new problem that I've not really ever come across before. And so I'm thinking, right, go away and think, this is the problem. They are, I'm sitting down the floor. And as soon as I've hit the floor, they are piling on top. This is not a good (laughs) situation. So I'm going to get some um, game spots. You know, there's like little circles. You can get little kind of rug circles or whatever and place them in a quite a big circle and tell them to find one and sit on it. And so therefore I've solved that problem. So it's really about not thinking that, oh my goodness, this happened, this lesson, it's a disaster. I'm a terrible group teacher, but really kind of strategizing what led up to that. What, um, what kind of can I do? What can I try? And it's trial and error quite a lot of the time. But um, it's constantly trying to work with the things that you have in front of you, really. But as I say, if you've got that structure, then that's the first thing that needs to be in place. Yeah, it's it's, it's very interesting how teaching has changed pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic and how, how the psychology of being locked up for long periods of time. You know, here in Melbourne, it was almost it was 18 months out of a 24 month period anywhere in the year i think you had didn't you yeah i'm oh, sorry anywhere in the world <laughs> yeah yeah it's the i think it's the one world record australians aren't proud of having because <laughs> we normally like our achievements <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no. yeah they definitely like they came back from that and we noticed obviously having been with their parents they're much more kind of they're not really sure of boundaries with other adults so then that that's where the kind of more affectionate comes into play but also we found that they are slightly less resilient like emotionally needy if they can't do something straight away they want us to solve it we you know that's not what we're there for we're there for them to learn how to problem solve slightly less independent um, and also, we noticed that just down to the the kind of the real bare bones, like recognizing letters, you know. Um, so I think hopefully this impact won't be around for too much longer. But we do have to adapt. That's what we that's what we're there to do. These are the things I've noticed have happened, and therefore I'm going to change my um, I'm going to add in this, or I'm going to change my approach slightly to to meet these needs, and that's what we're constantly doing. Yeah, I've definitely noticed the resiliency one. Like people are giving up way, way, way sooner than what they used to, or or just sometimes just sitting there and staring instead of having a go. And that's that's one thing I can tell you more from my personality type because I'm the complete opposite of that. That's absolutely driving me bananas. So, have, what, what are you doing to actively kind of um, nurture some resilience within your students? Well, I think. As piano teachers, um, I think we have to, and I'm sure it's the same with guitar, we have to not be afraid to know that there are steps to learning and steps to their independence. So, for example, I've always said I'm not a big fan of having parents in the room because I think that what the parents do, and I'm a parent myself, I do it myself, I know I do, you can't help it. 
you've got your child there, your child's being asked to do something, you help them to do it. So you're thinking about the outcome of, you know, okay, so they've been told to do something quick, you know, place your finger one on the sea, quick manhandle their thumb onto the sea. But what we're doing as teachers is that we're thinking about the process. So who of my students in this room can independently think through that, um, that what I've asked them to do so they can think, right, okay, so the C, I need the two black key pattern. The finger one is my thumb. Okay, so this is where the C is. You know, So they're thinking through it and we need them to be able to do that. But what are the steps for them to be able to do that? And are we absolutely certain we've got those in um, our plans and in our approach? Um, and if we need to come back down those steps and give them a bit more of a crutch, but not a crutch that's just giving them the answer because we still want them to be thinking through things, um, but giving them prioritizing that emotional resilience, that kind of building that emotional resilience, their confidence, their self-efficacy, which is a massive one and always has been, are they, you know, are they feeling about themselves like, oh, yes, I can do this. Um, that's the main thing we can instill in them. That idea of I can do this because, um, because you know, I've been given the steps or, you know. So if we can make sure that we are providing those steps for them so that we're not saying here is the final kind of version of what we want you to do. And then them just crumbling because I think I'm not going to be able to do that, uh, which, you know, we, that is something that we've got to be quite careful of. And trusting the process, to be honest, trusting that, you know, if we're giving them a crutch, if we're putting the pom pom on the C to show them where the C is, but we're not going to show them where the D and the E is because we want them to apply their knowledge of stepping notes or something, um, we won't have to put that pom pom on their forever we probably can not put it on next week or the week after but we've managed to allow them to take part in the lesson to to get something out of it and to um to feel confident some really really important stuff so i hope our, all our listeners are taking notes i'm sure when you're talking about helicopter parents talking about their thumb or coaching from the sidelines we we all immediately thought of someone <laughs> as well but yeah what you said is absolutely spot on there and i'd completely forgotten about those little pom-pom things i think at one point in time they were just all over our house <laughs> there and everywhere these little pom-pom wires if you don't know what i'm talking about head to the uh or sign up for keynotes with melanie if you're a piano teacher shameless uh plug for me it's it's a it's a great program but i've seen firsthand how powerful it can be for kids how very different it is from your standard you know here's the, the book for the exam let's learn that or let's run through some scales you know, your traditional approach to learning, but just the little crazy things like pom 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 poms with googly eyes and stuff like that on them. It just makes <laughs> so getting back to the actual curriculum itself, is it something that you planned out from the beginning, or is it something that you kind of evolved it over time and then arrived at? Okay, I think I'm going to take the sum of my knowledge and make something specifically, which ended up being called keynotes. So. I took some of my, I took a lot of my knowledge from working in with older kids um, in a class setting. I, you know, to take your question quite literally, I came up with the name Keynotes Music before I even started my first class. For some reason, I knew I just wanted to brand it and not just say, I'm teaching group piano lessons, but to say, I'm teaching Keynotes Music. It's, you know, I, I kind of had that foresight to do that. Um, and then, the funny question about it evolving, it's evolving still all the time because we are responding to post-pandemic children. We are deciding that actually, you know, this program is used all over the world and things that I'm not finding are a particular issue in the UK might be a little bit more of an issue elsewhere. Like, for example, here we don't tend to get older learners. Um, we, my, The majority of my learners that come to me are between age well, I've got my little keynotes age four to five and then um, age six to maybe nine. But in other parts of the world, um, there are age 10, 11, 12 year olds starting that need to begin a program. And we decided that storytellers was just not suited to them in terms of engaging content. So we created another program called Keynotes Play. So it's just constantly evolving, really. And I appreciate the teachers all the time for their feedback on that kind of thing as well. 
Awesome. Yeah, it is really unique how demographically I noticed America just seems to have more teenage learners than young learners. Once they get that with guitar anyway, but they get the rock bug and all of a sudden they fall into this, you know, contemporary instrument and start playing. But yeah, it, same thing in Australia, a lot less teenage learners than what we have with our kid learners and even adults. There seems to be this gap for the teenage years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, at what point did you get your first licensee or your first person to come on board in your program? It was might even have not been a, a program guitar needed is anything to go by. Someone just said, hey, what are you doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it was um, really about four years ago. I think Amy was one of the first, actually. So um, we have uh, a few that started, uh, yeah, roughly four years ago. And, ha you know, as all these things happen, I was happily just creating my own program for my own lessons I did start employing teachers to teach these classes kind of around London um, and Surrey where I live. And then um, and then people on Facebook were kind of saying, what is this you're doing? This looks really interesting. When he, Someone literally said to me in a, a comment on one of my posts about something that I'd done, when are you going to sell us this program? And I hadn't even thought about it until that point. And so, um, so that's kind of how it all kicked off. And then I realized that you can't just sell a bunch of teaching materials without giving the support and the training on how, you know, group teaching works, because most of the teachers that come to me have only ever taught one to one. And as you know, it's a completely different uh, beast, isn't it, really? And it's something that more and more teachers are realizing is going to be really great for them and really great for their kids. But how you go about it is a completely uh, different matter to anything that they've ever had to consider. So, so then the first thing actually was that I started doing some training, some group piano training. And actually, in my when I was a secondary school teacher, I was actually a, a, a teacher mentor. So I actually trained people to become teachers. So that kind of side of things I was quite experienced at. Um, and then it was, right, so you've now kind of had this training about group piano. Now I've got this program. Would you like to use it? And that's kind of how it all started. Fantastic. And, yeah, you, you're absolutely spot on. I'm saying that a lot. That's how I know I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm dealing with a great guest on the podcast because everything you say is, is just magic. But providing that training is really essential. And just like you wouldn't expect your student to be able to pick up a music book and just play it, it's really how can you expect a teacher to just pick up a curriculum and, and know how to deliver it straight away? So, uh, Yeah, and it's it beyond, beyond, even, beyond even just the curriculum, it's the general matters of teaching a group of children. So in the training, there's stuff that's not even related to the curriculum. It's talking about behavior management and how students learn and differentiation and things that are more general. And in terms of the, the number of people you got, you don't have to tell me the exact number, but roughly how big have you scaled this thing to? How many people around the world do you have using your keynotes now? Over 100 studios at the moment, yeah. And within a, yeah, a four-year period, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's, um, it's been fun. <laughs> so is this all organic? Did you sort of do anything deliberately or intentionally to grow the program? I would say it's mostly organic. I've been lucky enough to have people like Tim who first approached me, I think it must have been four years ago around this time, um, and other kind of people who have got a presence on Facebook contacting me and asking me to present about group piano. Um, and I've um, – so that's happened quite a few times. Um, and it's just kind of about offering your own perspective on – what group piano is or what what learning your particular instrument actually looks like um and if people like your perspective then they will kind of follow up <laughs> basically I'm, I'm in the very like early stages of in terms of being a curriculum designer and a program license sir um i've not done really anything i've not really scratched the surface of what i should be doing but um, you know, so I'm talking things like um, kind of advertising. Things. I haven't really done anything because I'm, the evolving of the curriculum takes up most of my time. And then I'm doing a PhD in group piano and I've got three kids. So really, it's 
I could really um, do with doing a lot more, but it doesn't tend to happen. Yeah, crazy stuff. It's amazing how the busy people get lots of stuff done. <laughs> Seems like the busier you are, the more you get done. And we might have to get you back on the, um, you know, the time management edition of this podcast at some point as well. Has anything in particular like changed or adapted once you got other teachers involved and they started giving you feedback? Has there been any big breakthroughs you've had when other people, your licensees have come and said, hey, this would be good or why don't we try this or could you make that? Okay, so I would say the biggest one near the beginning was adding kind of extra games. I didn't really have games at the beginning. Um, I had, you know, the, the, the piece, a listening task, some composing, etc. But the actual separate games that were related to the learning, um, they were not a big feature at the very beginning. So we quickly um, picked up that one and ran with that. And then I guess the most recent one has been, as I said earlier, that kind of right, we need a program for older beginners because we're getting teens and tweens that do not want to do storytellers. Um, what should we do with them? And so that kind of keynote's play has been the, the biggest change recently. We also had, um, I mean, the members have been amazing, really. We've had, uh, I decided, I was teaching some adults, so I decided to add an adult program which now is kind of quite a mixed level program because we find that adult learners are so diverse in their progress that we need to, our differentiation to be very wide. But also a few teachers said to me, um, Little Keynotes is great, but have you got anything for three-year-olds? So I ended up adding a three-year-old program. So yeah, it, I have kind of been just being led by um, the needs out there. I don't teach the three-year-olds myself, yet I've created a program because that's what people wanted. So um, I'm, you know, very open to listening to that kind of feedback. And then on the whole, in terms of individual lessons and individual programs, there hasn't been a, a huge amount of changes. Um, people, you know, they come across keynotes, they start using it, and it's so completely different to anything they've done before that they just roll with it, really. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And obviously you've got lots of guitar teachers listening, but I'm sure there'll be a few piano teachers as well. For people who do want to write their own curriculum or create their own curriculum, because uh, I've been asked this question a number of times by guitar teachers in the program, what advice would you have or what tips would you have for people looking to go out and create their own curriculum? Oh, looking to trade it. I mean, obviously, first of all, you have to make it. and You have to... Well, and I, I, may, I may just preface this this isn't necessarily to sell or license to other people at this point just if they're in their own studio and they're dissatisfied with whichever book is the most popular piano book or guitar book on the market at the moment going you know what this just doesn't work uh even if it's just internal at this point what advice okay do you have? so i think you have to think about your teaching values what are you wanting the outcomes to be what kind of um I suppose, what kind of approach are you taking? As we talked about earlier, if you're kind of right an exams factory, then it might be one way. But or do you value improv more? Do you value creative opportunities? Do you value um, listening and, and other and movement and kind of thinking around um, what kind of experiences you want your kids to learn through? And then my big, big advice would be have an overarching picture of what they're going to learn. So um, instead of kind of going from lesson to lesson, we're going to do this piece and then we're going to do this piece. And if you have an overarching picture, you will know what the progression between the pieces should be or between the programs or between the lessons should be because you have a set of skills and objectives that you want them to um, cover over a period of time um, and then, you know, maybe if you say if you created one book and then you say, right, OK, here's the next book. How are these skills and objectives going to develop? Um, what, what which direction they're going to go in? And then it's so I, I would say that the overall overarching picture is a really important thing to think about. Yeah, really, really important stuff. And I think the most important thing to draw out there was, yeah, what do you value and how do you instill you into the curriculum? Because that's ultimately, at the end of the day, what's going to make it unique and resonate with the kind of students who you're going to resonate with. Naturally. Yes, absolutely. That's a perfect point. <laughs> 
Now, the follow-up to that, of course, now that we do have a curriculum, how would we go about getting licenses in the program? Should we wish to explore that option? I mean, I'm not sure I'm 100% best placed to answer that in the sense that I did kind of fall upon it um, <laughs> as in the way that I did. Um, I think it's just um, being visible um, on the socials and showing people what you're doing, those values that you talked about, that will those resonate with your kids, but they might may also resonate with other teachers that really like your approach. Um, I do think we need to be doing something different because I think, you know, I was at a music education show last week and my favorite thing to do is to rifle through all the piano books. But essentially, they all look the same. They're all approaching piano learning in a very similar way to each other. So what are you doing differently? And then it's kind of about, I don't know, whether it's blog posts, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's something to deliver your uniqueness and the way that you're doing um, you, essentially. Um, and then it will resonate with some people and um, they will, you know, want to kind of follow what you're doing and then, you know, maybe one day use your materials. Some really, really solid advice. And, yeah, it is amazing to think that you've grown it to over 100 studios pretty much organically and naturally. So, you know, just the fact that you can do it means anyone out there listening to this who's got similar ideas or ambitions, uh, it, it can be done, which is really, really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Do you ever reflect upon your, I call them grand students, so they're not your students, they're the students of your teachers who you're kind of like their grandma, but as a teacher version. <laughs> That's funny. I do. I, you know, what I love to do. Um, I love it. I, I love in my Facebook feed. I see all of these different posts from teachers all around the world, um, showing what they're doing in their lessons, and obviously they're doing keynotes, uh, using keynote material, doing the keynotes lessons. And sometimes I love to show my own students. Look, this person in Canada is using the same book as you, and they're doing the same task as you. And I love doing that. So, so yeah, those are moments where you're like, wow, this is amazing. I'm, the Keynotes program is impacting children all over the world. Um, and there's, you know, no higher ambition, really. For a teacher, you can impact the students in front of you. But to think that you've impacted um, other teachers and their students is, is really an honor. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And the impact we have on our students and our broader communities is absolutely, you know, tremendous as a music teacher. Often, you know, we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we do and what we contribute. And often society doesn't, uh, you know, remunerate us properly as well. And it's disappointing in a way to see how watered down the importance of music has become and even education has become in this contemporary society. But we can really be the backbone and foundation of our community and we can do so much. And, you know, when most people think of their favorite teachers, uh, I always say the teachers is, is how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as your worst teacher in school or one of the better teachers in school? And we can have, because music is you know so culturally important, we can have that huge impact on people. And, you know, people, piano players tend to play longer than most orchestral bass instruments, but with guitar players, like the retention isn't just until they turn 18 and mum and dad stop paying for lessons and then they never pick it up again. Guitar is one of those instruments where people play until you know, the day they die. And sometimes they put it down for a couple of months or even a couple of years, but they always come back to it and always play. So to think that we right now here today could be teaching someone who 80 years from now is still playing guitar or still playing piano is absolutely amazing. And then how many people do they influence as well? Yeah, absolutely. So Melanie, it's been absolutely great having you on the podcast. Where can our listeners find out more about you, connect with you online, uh, connect with Keynotes and find out more about what you're doing on the piano front there? So I have a website, uh, keynotes-music.com. Um, but I'm also very active on Facebook. I have a Facebook group called Teaching Group Piano. Um, obviously, Keynotes has got a Facebook page. So anyone can just message me anytime um, and I'm always happy to converse with anyone about these uh, matters because I'm very passionate about them. Well, I can definitely see that in your voice. So we'll post the links wherever people are listening to this podcast. So uh, guys, we'll make sure you can find your way to Melanie and her keynotes program. My last question is, is there any final advice or wisdom that you'd pass on to our listeners? 
I think the biggest thing that has to drive all of us, and you know, you talked about community and the impact that we have as music teachers. The biggest thing that has to drive everything we're doing is that um, very important role that we have of passing music on, of nurturing young learners, their tomorrow's musicians, but also knowing that we are nurturing their emotional well-being um, and all of the things that we know that music can do. So I think just making sure that we've got always got that at the forefront of our mind. We are being child-led, child-centered in our approach um, is, for me, the most important thing that we're doing and making our lessons inclusive, giving opportunities to more learners. Um, you really can't ask for anything more as a music teacher. Wow, we Well, Melanie, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. I uh, always judge how good the conversation in the episode was by how excited I am at the end of it and how much I just – it's almost 7 a.m. here in Australia. Got up early for this one, but I'm already on fire, ready to have a great day teaching. So, you know, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I know our listeners would have gotten a lot out of it, and we look forward to touching base again soon. So, thank you again on behalf of the Top Music community for coming on, and to our listeners at home, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next time. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.